The Danielle integral is a generalization of the Lebesgue integral. Instead of the space r to the k, we define the Danielle integral for functions from an arbitrary set x to r. This generalized integral has important applications to other branches of mathematics, such as probability theory. In this program, we'll concentrate on the definition itself rather than the applications. But before I start on this, I want you to do some work. I'm going to show you our usual animation of the four-stage Lebesgue definition, taking k equal one for simplicity. And for each stage, I want you to think carefully about how we could replace the real line by a completely arbitrary set x. Well, how can we generalize this four-stage construction of the Lebesgue integral in order to get a definition of integration for functions on some arbitrary set x? Well, in the case when x was r, in the Lebesgue integral case, we started off naturally with the first stage where we define the characteristic uh, functions of bounded intervals. Now, in our case, x can be anything. It can be a set of positive integers, a set of polynomials, a set of outcomes of throws of a pair of dice, anything at all. And it's clear that for such a general set, we can't have a definition of a bounded interval in general. So we just can't start off our construction of the Danielle integral at this first stage. Let's try a different approach. Let's look at the four-stage construction of the Lebesgue integral from a more general viewpoint. If we ignore the details of the individual stages, we can look at the general technique of going from one stage to the next. We've pointed out in the past that we use two extension techniques. First, we extend the characteristic functions by linearity to the step functions. We then take limits of increasing sequences with bounded integrals. Finally, we extend L inc to get the linear space L1. And what I'm going to do is use essentially these same techniques in order to define our generalized integral, our Danielle integral. Well, I've already seen that I can't start off with this stage. We don't have intervals, so I must start off with this second stage where I have a linear space corresponding to our linear space of step functions and some sort of elementary idea of integral corresponding to the areas of step functions. And from then, I'll proceed uh, using these techniques. So what I want to do is I want to abstract the essential properties of step functions and their areas to get a general definition of what I'm going to call elementary functions and their elementary integrals. Well, let's start off with the elementary functions. What are the essential properties of step functions that I want to carry over? Well, uh, we've already seen that they form a linear space, so I'll assume that my elementary functions form a linear space too. Now, I know that step functions are also closed under this taking of absolute values, so I'll assume that this also holds for my elementary functions. <laughs> 
And it turns out that, in fact, these are the only two conditions that we have to impose. We're going to start off with any set of functions whatsoever that obeys these two conditions, and we'll take that as our starting point, our set of elementary functions. And, of course, what we also need is a generalization of the Lebesgue integral of a step function to apply to our elementary integral of an elementary function. In order to distinguish this from the Lebesgue integral, we'll use the letter capital P instead of an integral sign. Now, we want P to satisfy the essential properties of our old integral on step functions. First, the most obvious property is linearity. Then there's the property of being positive on positive elementary functions. Well, there might be other properties of the areas of step functions that we'd like to carry over as axioms, but I'm going to stick with these two for the moment. And we'll see whether they're all right, because what I want to do is to take any system obeying these axioms as my elementary integral, and any system of elementary functions obeying these axioms, and see whether I can extend it to get L inc and L1 and so on. Well, before I carry on with this general construction, I must emphasize that I can take any system whatsoever obeying these axioms, and they don't have to look anything at all like step functions and the areas of step functions. For example, I could take for the arbitrary set x a set of positive integers. Now, here I've abbreviated my conditions uh, in this way, and here is my specific example. I'm claiming that this set of functions phi and this operator p obey my axioms. Now, what are the set of functions? They're those which vanish except for a finite set, and the operator p is defined on them by being just that finite sum of their values. Well, I claim that this set of functions phi does obey my axioms for L. So what I have to do is verify that they do form a linear space which is closed under the taking of absolute values. Suppose we have a function phi with values like this. We're taking all the values after the fourth to be zero, so this function satisfies our conditions. Now, let's take a second function, also satisfying the conditions. All the values after the fifth are zero. Now, let's take a linear combination, just the sum of the two functions. The sum of the functions also satisfies the conditions of being zero outside a finite set of integers. So our functions do form a linear space. And it's easy to see that the modulus of each function is still in the space. And so the set of phi's obeys the axioms for L. Now what about the operator P on it? Is it a linear positive operator? Well, let's see. Uh, supposing here I take a linear combination of phi's, then on the right-hand side at each point I have the same linear combination, and so I get the same linear combination of the sum. Linearity is very easy. Well, what about positivity? If I have a positive function here, then each term of this finite sum is positive, and so the whole sum is positive, so it's a positive operator. So this system does obey my axioms, and we have a concrete example of a set of elementary functions and an elementary integral on them. Well, let's go back to the general construction. Now, what I want to do now is to take any set of functions obeying these axioms and any operator on them obeying these axioms, and I want to extend to L inc by using my same extension process using limits. We take increasing sequences of elementary functions with bounded elementary integrals, and the limit function, the set of all limit functions, is called L inc, 
And for each f, we define the integral of f as being simply the limit of the sequence of elementary integrals. Well, that's a very easy definition to make. But the question is, is it a meaningful definition? Well, there are a few problems. How do I know if I take two different sequences in here, I'm going to end up with the same value of the integral? But before I can even ask this question, how do I know that an increasing sequence of elementary functions with bounded integrals is going to converge everywhere to some function f? Well, in fact, I know that this can't be so, because even in the Lebesgue case, we had to be content with convergence almost everywhere. That is, convergence except on a null set. Now, this is a generalization, so certainly we can't do better than that. But what is a null set of an arbitrary set? Well, in the case of the real line, we defined a null set in terms of intervals whose total length was as small as we liked. Well, we know that we don't have the concept of an interval for our arbitrary set x, so that won't do. Well, what we do is we're going to use a definition of null set which guarantees that this works. We're going to define a null set of x to be precisely the set of points of x for which such an increasing sequence fails to converge. We say that a set n is a null subset of x if, and only if, there's an increasing sequence of elementary functions with bounded elementary integrals such that the sequence diverges on the points of n. This may remind you of a result we had for step functions on R with the Lebesgue integral. There, with our old definition of a null subset of R, we saw that every increasing sequence of step functions with bounded integrals converged, except on a null set. In other words, this type of sequence of step functions can only diverge on a null set. And the converse theorem was that every null set can be characterized in this way. That is, given any null set n, then there exists an increasing sequence of step functions with bounded integrals which diverges on n. So, because of those two theorems, we could actually take this statement as our definition of a null subset of R. The definition gives us precisely the same collection of null sets that we had before. So if we take this as our definition of a null subset of X, it will work, as it should, in the special case when the set X equals R and the elementary functions are step functions on R. And so with that definition, we solve our problem. Every sequence of elementary functions like this converges except on a null set, because by definition, the points where it fails to converge form a null set. Well, uh, you probably think that's a bit of a trick, but I think it's very elegant. And it certainly solves our problem about the convergence almost everywhere. Well, what about the other problem about consistency? If I have two different sequences of elementary functions, do they give me the same value of my integral? Well, in fact, to get consistency, we have to impose one extra condition on our elementary integral. And to see what this condition is, we have to go back to the Lebesgue case and see how we prove con uh, consistency in that case. Here's the statement of consistency for the integral on L inc. The proof of this in the Lebesgue case depends on this property of step functions. If a sequence theta n of positive step functions is decreasing and converges to the zero function almost everywhere, then the integrals converge to zero. I won't go into the details of how we use this property to prove consistency. The proof is in unit three. It merely involves taking each theta n to be the difference of appropriate size and phi's. And the argument works just as well whatever elementary functions we have, not just for step functions on R, just so long as we have this property in the first place. So we have to be able to prove this property 
for arbitrary elementary functions. Well, the proof in the Lebeg case depended crucially on the fact that the domain was R. We use the properties of intervals and so on, which, they, well, they just don't generalize to an arbitrary set X. So we haven't got a hope of proving this property. Well, what do we do? Well, we do the same thing as we did in the case of null sets. We actually impose this property as one final condition on our elementary integral. And this important condition is called the Daniel condition. Well, it might look exactly the same as this property, but it's equivalent to it. We don't have to say positive, because if our functions are descending to zero, they're automatically positive. And we don't need almost everywhere, because in fact, you can show it's equivalent. Well, having imposed these conditions on our elementary integral, we have a well-defined L inc. First of all, we've solved the problem of convergence almost everywhere by our definition of a null set. And secondly, we've solved the problem of consistency of the integral by our imposition of the Daniel condition. And so that gives us a well-defined L inc. Now, what about L1? Well, just as in the case of the Lebesgue integral, L1 is defined to be the differences of functions in L inc. And we define the integral of the function h simply as the differences of the integrals. And the consistency of this definition for L1 follows very easily, just as it did in the Lebesgue case. So that's the Daniel integral. It's a very simple extension of the uh, Lebesgue integral. Well, let's go back to our original example and try and find out what L inc and L1 looked like in that case. Well, remember our set of elementary functions were those which vanished outside a finite set, and our elementary integral was just the finite sum of their values. Well, before I go on to discuss L inc, there's just one problem I have to tackle. When I first looked at this example, I hadn't actually realized the necessity for the Daniel condition, so I have to verify that now. Well, that's easy. If I do have a decreasing sequence of elementary functions which goes to zero, then each of these terms in this finite sum also goes to zero. And so this sum, this integral, goes to zero too. The Daniel condition is verified. I have a bona fide elementary integral. So we can look at L inc, and let's see what sort of functions are in L inc. They're functions which are the limits almost everywhere of sequences. Almost everywhere is except on a null set. So the first thing we have to do is to determine what are the null subsets of x? Well, remember the definition. First note that we can always take the phi ends in the definition to be positive. The reason for this is quite simple. If a sequence phi n characterizes a null set n, then so does the sequence phi n minus phi 1. And each term of the sequence is positive because the phi ends are increasing. So we can take positive sequences in our definition of a null set. Now consider any such sequence for our specific example. It turns out that there is no point S of x for which the ties diverge. We can prove this as follows. Since the ties are positive, each of these values is positive. So for each point s, psi n s is less than or equal to the sum of the values. But the sequence of integrals is bounded. So there is a number k such that p psi n is less than k for all n. In other words, there is no point s for which the psi's can diverge. So there is no point of x contained in a null set. The only null set is the empty set. So in this example, convergence almost everywhere Convergence except in a null set means convergence everywhere because the only null set is the empty set. Our sequences converge everywhere. L inc 
consists of the limit of all such sequences, what sort of functions are an L-link? Well, remember, each phi has only a finite set of values, but func f, being a limit of a sequence of phi's, can have more and more non-zero values. f is not restricted to having only a finite number of non-zero values. However, f cannot take negative values past a certain point. We can see why if we look again at the first elementary function, phi1. This had to have zero values after a certain finite number, and the phi ends increased towards f. So it's impossible for f to be negative past that point. So our function f can only have a finite number of negative values. So, in fact, f must be positive outside a finite set. What about the integral of f? Well, it's the limit of this sequence of sums which are bounded, so in fact the sum of the, well, the infinite series uh, corresponding to f must be convergent. So, I can write that this way. I said that f gives me a convergent series. I've actually put absolutely convergent because remember, f has all but a finite number of positive terms and the finite number of negative terms doesn't affect the absolute convergence. Well, that's clear enough. What L inc looks like, it's functions like that. Now, what about L1? Well, L1 is the difference of two functions, and each of these gives me an absolutely convergent series, and so the difference of two absolutely convergent series also gives me an absolutely convergent series. Now, because of the minus g here, I don't have any restriction on L1 that I can only have a finite number of negative terms. So, in fact, L1 just consists of all functions which give rise to an absolutely convergent series. Well, that's a, a rather interesting example. In fact, starting off with this same set of positive integers and a different elementary integral, uh, I could choose this one. Uh, you might like to try for yourselves to find out what L inc and L1 look like. In this case, it turns out that the null sets are very interesting. They're all the sets that don't contain this first term, 1. Well, there are lots of other examples in the correspondence text. In fact, we can have examples where we start off with the set X being R, the real line, uh, but use a different set L other than step functions, a different elementary integral, and still end up with the Lebesgue integral. Or we could start off with R and get a different sort of integral defined on R. There are all sorts of interesting examples we can get using this Daniel integral. Now, the Daniel integral is a very beautiful extension, generalization of the Lebesgue integral. It's a lovely construction, from our point of view, for two reasons. The first reason is it gives us a generalization which applies to any arbitrary set x, not just r or r to the k. And secondly, it highlights for us just what the conditions were that we needed to construct successfully the Lebesgue integral. These two conditions, in the case of step functions, were the fact that an increasing sequence of step functions with bounded integrals only diverges on a null set, and the se second condition was the, the Daniel condition, that a decreasing sequence of step functions, decreasing to zero, has an integral which decreases to zero. Now, when you go on to study the Daniel integral in, in the last units, you'll see that all the theorems that held for the Lebesgue integral also hold good for the Daniel integral too. And that ought to help you in your revision of the Lebesgue integral.